Hi everyone, thanks for visiting my channel. If you're new here, welcome. I'm Carol, the Thrifty Chic Housewife. So today we are going to be making Bavarian white wine sauerkraut. I'm so excited to share this recipe with you. Um, Bavarian white wine sauerkraut was something that I had found in the grocery store and we really enjoyed eating it. So when I decided to try fermenting, I went on a hunt for a delicious recipe to make this at home and I found one. Um, thanks to my friend Cindy at the Indian Preservation, she recommended the fermented vegetables book. So we're gonna be using it as a guide to make our kraut and they have a recipe in here for wine kraut. Now their recipe calls for using red wine, but I'm gonna use white because that's what I was trying to replicate from what I had found at the grocery store. But So you can use either red or white, it's entirely up to you. So um, if you're new to fermenting like I was, there's a little bit um, to read up on and learn about, but it's not complicated at all. It's not as scary as it seems to me. It seems scary to let something sit and ferment um, not being in the refrigerator um, but I found that it wasn't scary at all and my the first batch of sauerkraut I made turned out beautiful and it was so delicious so I want to share with you all how to do it now the other thing that we are going to be using and I think that these just made it help make it even simpler to do for me anyway are the ball fermentation lids and springs these are new this year and when I first saw them at my local Meyer, which is where I buy most of my canning supplies I'm like, hmm, that's interesting. Didn't really give it another thought until um, I decided I wanted to try sauerkraut. Thought maybe I need to check those out. So I did, and what you get in your kit is really quite cool. Get it open here. You get, if you get um, this the fermentation lids and springs if you get just this you're going to get two springs which is going to help keep your cabbage submerged under the brine and then you also get two special lids and this is what your lids look like it's just a plastic lid with a little valve on top and the valve is really important because it helps you to avoid mold. Um, Ball says the fermentation lid uses a valve to allow CO2 to escape and keeps outside contaminants from causing mold in the jar. So that makes it a little less scary, right? Um, and then you can easily check up on your fermented foods. The stainless steel spring with its unique design keeps the fermented food safely under the brine while being easy to remove and replace. No fumbling around with a wet weight again. Um, when I first started looking into making sauerkraut, most people use either a plate weighted down by um, water in a jar or they use a smaller um, canning jar and put in on top and it also contains water to act as a weight so this takes that you don't have to mess with that and i made it so easy for me to make kraut for the first time i was just very very pleased with having these two um I was having these items to help me out now they do also ball also does make what they call a fermentation kit which is basically you basically get a quart jar a spring, a lid, and I think they include a packet of um, canning and pickling salt. Um, when you do fermentations or ferments, uh, you should use a pure salt. Um, I know the book I'm using recommends using an unrefined sea salt. I'm just going to be using our canning salt. I have plenty of that on hand because I do canning. Um, so that's what I'm going to be using. And I had plenty of jars, so I didn't need the jars. So I was really happy that they sold just the lids and springs because that's all that I needed. But if you do not have, if you're not a canner and you don't have the jars and the canning salt, you can go ahead and buy the kit. It has everything in it that you need um, to make a beautiful ferment. So we are going to be doing our sauerkraut. So the first thing we are going to do is I'm gonna bring you in close and just kind of show you the process that I went through. Um, they recommend obviously washing your cabbage. I removed the outer the very outer two leaves first and then I rinsed my cabbage and then we're going to reserve two other leaves that we rinse really well um, 
because that's going to go underneath our spring and help cover our cabbage. So you need a couple of whole leaves and then the rest of your cabbage, you're going to take the core out and then you're going to um, julienne or shred it, however you want to do it. I just use a knife to shred mine up pretty finely. It worked really well for me. Um, the other thing you're going to need, like I said, is the salt and a nice big bowl and then your jars and your lids. That's all there is to it. There's nothing, no other special equipment that you need. Now the one thing that they mentioned in this book that I thought was really interesting is you have to massage your salt into your cabbage to get it to release some liquid so, and that's what makes your brine. And one of the things that they mentioned in the process is to make sure you don't wash your hands with antibacterial soap. That can interfere with the fermentation process and I thought that that was a very interesting fact. So make sure your hands are nice and squeaky clean but don't use bacterial, antibacterial soap. So I'm going to bring you in and we're going to get started. Okay, like I said, what we're going to do is we are going to remove these very outer leaves. I'm just going to get rid of those. You're going to need, I don't think I mentioned this, you're going to need about three and a half pounds of cabbage. So we'll get rid of those and then we're going to rinse the rest of it and then I'm going to reserve this leaf. Looks pretty pretty. I don't like that one either. We are going to save two of these most outer leaves. Okay, so once you uh, get everything rinsed really well, um, you're gonna cut your cabbage. I just cut the bottom off and then we want to kind of cut around that core. Get rid of it and then just go in and cut up your cabbage. Fairly fine. Okay, once you got your uh, cabbage all shredded up, you can see how mine's pretty finely shredded. You can use a mandolin or you can use a, process, a food processor to do this. I don't mind doing it by hand and sometimes it's going to take out your aggressions <laughs> in chopping. So um, I just did mine by hand, but you can do it the other ways as well. So now we're going to get ready to massage our um, salt into our cabbage. We are going to start out with one tablespoon of pure salt. We're just going to kind of sprinkle it on our cabbage. And then we're going to start massaging. The book describes the massaging process, not a gentle back rub, but a deep tissue massage. So we're going to give our cabbage a really nice back rub. And you'll see that it starts to turn shiny and it'll look wet. It's starting to release some of its juices. Okay, after you've massaged it for a few minutes, I've been massaging mine for four or five minutes, it, you're gonna see that it's starting to see how wet it looks. It's starting to release its juices and that's what we want it to do. And you should start seeing some liquid pool in the bottom of your bowl, but we need enough liquid to um, cover our cabbage. So what I did last time um, is I let mine sit and the book does talk about this, is I just covered mine and I let it sit for, you can let it sit for up to an hour to get it to produce some more juice. The salt will get it to release more of its liquid. And you also, at this point, you wanna taste it for the salt level. So it should taste nice and salty, but not overpowering. And at this point, if it's not salty enough, you could add some more salt, which will help in help in getting it to create brine for you. But if it's salty enough, you're gonna to wanna to let, let it just sit to get its juices flowing. So that's what I'm gonna do right now. I'm going to cover mine and I'm gonna let it sit for just a bit to get some more liquid to pull up in the bottom of my bowl. Make sure we have enough brine to cover our cabbage. And when we come back, I'll show you how to put it in the jars. 
Okay guys, we are back. Um, I've let my kraut sit for about an hour and I'm starting to see more liquid pool in the bottom of my bowl. So we're gonna go ahead and move forward and see if we have enough to start our fermenting process. But before we get started, I am going to add some organic caraway seeds. This is the Bavarian part of the Bavarian white wine sauerkraut. And you can add to taste, you want one to two tablespoons in there and then we're gonna mix that in Okay, so now what we're gonna do is we're going to put our kraut into our jars. So we're gonna put in a little bit of our kraut and then you're gonna, a, a flat, object works the best, but the back of this wooden spoon worked pretty well for me the first time. So that's what I'm going to use this time. We're going to tamp it down. We want to release air bubbles and we want to pack it down. And then once you pack it down, then you can add a little more. We want two to three inches of head space. Okay, once you get your sauerkraut in there, you want to make sure that you get it in there nice and tight and make sure there aren't any straggler pieces on the edge, on the inside. We don't want any chance of any mold or anything growing in there. We want everything submerged under the brine. And what I did once I got all of my cabbage in there, I went ahead and poured the brine that was in the bottom of my bowl, I poured it into each jar. And all you need is a thin layer of brine on top of your cabbage, which we do have. And if you're running into problems with that, you can let it sit a little more. The fermentation book also gives some good recommendations of other things that you can do. The ball, um, the ball caning book and their instructions, and there are other instructions out there, are other places out there that do say that you can make your own brine, your own salt water, and add it. The fermentation vegetables book, they don't recommend doing that. And so far, I've not had to do that. Um, so I wouldn't, I would do that as a very last resort. There are other options in the book and I'm sure you can find other options online if you're having trouble getting your cabbage to make enough brine. But like I said, just letting it sit uh, for a while worked really well for me. So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna take our whole cabbage leaf, stick them in there and put that on top of everything. Push it down really well. And then we're going to add our spring and our lid. And I think that this is just genius. Thank you, Ball Fresh Preserving. Okay, and as you can see, there is a thin layer of brine on top of everything. And that's what we're looking for. So I know you're thinking, so what about the wine? Well, what we're gonna do, according to the instructions in the fermented vegetables book, they found in their test recipes that the, the wine had better flavor when you added it at the end. So what we're gonna do now is we're just gonna let our sauerkraut ferment and get all nice and yummy to our desired flavor. And then once we get there, then we're gonna add 
a quarter to a half a cup of each jar of whatever wine you like. If you want to do red, do red. Like I said, I did white wine, so I'm going to do some white wine. Last time I did Pinot Grigio. I'm thinking this time I might use a Riesling. So I, that's where we're going to go with that. So what you want to do also is their instructions say to make sure you place your jars um, inside another container or on top of a cookie sheet or something um, in case anything would bubble out. I didn't experience any of that. I'm not expecting to experience any of that, um, but it's nice to have something underneath it. And then you want to store your sauerkraut in a cool, dark place. The basement, our basement worked really well for us. Um, you can do it in your kitchen if you want to. If your kitchen's particularly warm, the Fermented Vegetables book recommends you maybe using a cooler with an ice pack in there to kind of keep it between 65 and 75 degrees. So you don't want it to be in a kitchen where it's overly warm. We don't want that because um, we don't want anything... We don't want to create an environment where something could go wrong, right? So you want to maintain the 65 to 75 degrees. So I'm going to pop mine in the basement and let them hang out there. And then at day four is when you can start testing it. Now they describe in the book, let's see. Oh, in the book, they describe how do you know when it's ready? You'll know when it's ready when it's pleasingly sour and pickly tasting without the strong acidity of vinegar. The cabbage has softened a bit but retains some crunch and the cabbage is more yellow than green and slightly translucent as if it's been cooked. So that's what we're looking for. When you get to that point, that's when you can add your wine and then you're gonna let it sit another day or two. Um, let the flavor kind of mellow and the wine to marry with the sauerkraut flavor and then you're done. So what I'm going to do, I'm gonna make this um, part one of this and then once my sauerkraut has fermented for several days or to until it's the flavor that I like, um, I, the last batch I made, I let it sit for about 10 days. And as a matter of fact, I'll show it to you. This is what it looks like after, actually it's been more like 12 days because it tend, I let it sit for about 10 days and then I added the wine and it's been two days since I added my wine. So this is what it looks like. You can tell that we have had some fermentation going on, that cabbage has lightened in color. It's not bright green anymore. It's more of a yellow white color as if it's been cooked. That's about what um, cabbage looks like when it's cooked. And we've got some beautiful wine brine on top of it. Um, the thing that you are gonna start to see as it sits and starts to ferment, you're gonna see bubbles. Not tons, but I had a nice layer of bubbles um, across the top of my sauerkraut as it fermented. And like I said, it did beautifully. I think these springs and the lids are absolutely genius. It kind of took the guesswork out of everything for me. It made me feel pretty safe doing it that way. And I didn't have any problems. I didn't have any weird things growing on top. I didn't have any mold. I didn't have anything that was strange go on. So I'm hoping this batch works out just as well. So like I said, um, in the next, in my follow-up video, I will show you how, what it tastes like, how to finish it up and all that. I'll, I'll put some other steps in there. I'll kind of sneak a day in there when we start to see bubbles and I'll film some of that so that you know what to expect. And then I will put the wine in it, let it sit a few more days, and then we will taste it. Okay, so what I need to know from all of you is, um, do you want to see a canning video on it? Now, once we are finished with our kraut, you can store it in the refrigerator for up to a year and it will stay totally fine. We don't have to can it. Um, but I, have what I was, so I wanted to get some feedback from you guys to find out if canning it is something that you want to see. Now, the one thing that I do want to point out because this took me a little bit by surprise, I, this is something I wasn't expecting, is, mm, it smells so good. The texture of fresh kraut is different than what we're used to buying in the grocery store. It has a crunchier texture to it. Hear the crunch? So canning it 
would take some of that away and make it more like what you're used to with a commercial kraut. It would be softer. The other way that you can do it is just keep it in the refrigerator like this. Um, and then you can cook it before you eat it. But you guys, this is absolutely amazing. Just like this, I could just eat it straight from the jar. It's so good. And I really appreciate the crunch. So give me some feedback. Do you want to see it canned up? I will be more than happy to do a canning session of the sauerkraut for you. Or are you happy to just keep it in the fridge as is? Um, it'll keep up to a year, but it's not going to last that long. I promise you. So we are all done for today. Like I said, I'm going to do a follow-up video for you and we'll, I'll show you kind of what to expect through the process and then we'll add the wine and let it sit and um, then we'll kind of wrap things up and I will add the canning part if that's what you're interested in. So leave me a comment and let me know. Thanks so much for joining me today. Remember to like, subscribe, and share and I will see you next time. Have a great day.